Let's start it. Where am I going down? All right, there are six elements uh, to the course, and we'll go through each one of them. And you do have a, a exam in the back of it. Um, I will key you on certain issues that this is on the test, a question on the test that will help you focus. Um, you need 80% or better on the test, um, but we can always point out what errors you made and you can go back and look at them and then correct them. Healthcare professionals have the responsibility to follow the section control standards of practice. That is what this is. The standards of practice of infection control. Realize that, um, as I call the alphabet, which I'll be going through shortly, it, there's a whole screw uh, of um, re regulatory agencies and overseers that we must follow what their recommendations are. Objectives. I'm not going to read the objectives. They're in the packet. I'll let that go. First one is OSHA, Occupational Self and Safety and Health Administration. Those are mandatory regulations for employees, employers to employees. So what OSHA says, for example, you must have a bloodborne pathogen exposure plan if you're a healthcare facility. You must have. You must have um, processes that will decrease the potential of an exposure to a bloodborne pathogen for your employees. Which also involves uh, doctor's offices. Uh, Centers for Disease Control gives guidelines. However, those guidelines are considered standards of practice. Food and Drug Administration, <coughs> biological products, medical devices, food supplies, cosmetics, any products that have to do with radiation. Am I going the wrong way? Yes. Uh, PESH is actually OSHA for the city hospitals. Same organization, just they deal with just the city agencies. Uh, New York State Department of Health, um, we have Part 405, which is the recommendations and requirements for hospitals. Uh, you have all New York State guidelines, New York State Department of Health guidelines, that's for guidelines like for HIV treatment and TB treatment and those things. They can, those are actually on the, the internet, so you can easily get them. And then there is the New York State Surgical and Invasive Procedure Protocol um, for each hospital. That's in Article 28 and must follow these recommendations. Then we have, I love regulations. Um, then we have Chapter 786 of the Laws of New York State that mandates healthcare workers comply with infection control practices and complete the course. That's why you're here because of Chapter 786. The New York State Department of Education is where we get our licensing from. And we do our education, we send them the requirements, and they give us our license. And then understand Part 90, 92, um, it defines that a professional misconduct for physicians, physician assistants, specialists, you can come up for charges if you do not adhere to scientifically approved infection control factors. For example, if you're in a doctor's office, I won't pick the dentist this time, if you're in a doctor's office or an endoscopy and you're going through an endoscopy and you think that the endoscopy um, scope that they're going to use, you didn't see them opening it up, and you think it was used on somebody else, it's your perception, and the, and the technician or the, the physician that's coming in didn't wash their hands in front of you, you can actually go to the Department of Health and say they're not following standard infection control product, protocols. <coughs> so it's out there. And my favorite joint submission. Um, that's how we get our recognition, uh, rec recognized accreditation um, to get CMS um, payments, and so we have to follow what their requirements are. The Association of Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, that's my group. Uh, Society of Healthcare Epidemiology in America is the physician group, and we do talk to each other. 
And then um, you have the um, ARN, the Association of OR Nurses, which gives standards of practice for the OR and OR type suites. And then you have the um, Gastronomy Nurses Association, which also does that for GI uh, suites. And then you have the Advance <coughs> of Medical Instrumentation, Amy, um, and I have to always read them because I'm always using just doing the, the, the alphabets, the Amy and whatnot. Amy is actually an organization that will tell you what you need to do with the device. For example, they will tell you that if you sterilize this, this scope here, your transportation has to be done in a certain way. So that's who does that one. So the ARN and the gastronomy nurses tell you what the person has to do, but the Amy does what you have to do with the device. If I talk too fast, fast, please stop me. I tend to do that a lot. Uh, implementation of this conduct standards. Um, basically, anybody can take you to court. You have to adhere to the standards of practice, and that includes. Um, I need to walk. Um, that includes if you're in a in an office and the technician comes in and you don't perceive that person washing their hands, you can actually call the Department of Health and have them checked. What's interesting with this one is that if you have people under you, say you're in the physician's office or a dental office, and you feel that that technician um, didn't wash their hands, who would be at, who would be able to be charged would be the technician and you, because you're the one covering the technician. Even if you're, you're um, we all do uh, take preceptorship or um, someone who has their license and they're going to an, um, a residency or pro, um, just learning the job and everything else. <coughs> if something happens, test question. If something happens, you need to realize that if someone brings up charges, both of you are responsible. <coughs> Not just you and not just the person who didn't do what they're supposed to do. Washing hands is one of them. But both of you are responsible. So both of you can go up for misconduct. All right. A patient calls with a complaint of a rash. Um, and states that her nephew was, had chicken pox two weeks ago and comes in and sits into the waiting room. <coughs> With, two, with other patients. That's a no-no. That patient's calling the, the front desk, telling them that that's a possibility. That person, if they're coming in, um, either has to be the last person of their day when no one is in the office or put in a separate room by themselves. Uh, patient sent to the floor reports from the ER indicates the patient has complaints of nice sweats and active productive cough. Nurse receives the report, enters the room without appropriate PPE, personal protective equipment. You have to, I mean, you're getting the report. This is the nurse that has the report. And the first thing you start looking at night sweats, productive for is TB. Or if it's not TB, it's something you don't know. So you need to be walking in there, being ready, and being understanding of what the ramifications are, and have the N95 on. Nurse examines in a home care uh, patient with dermatitis complications and the nurse does not use gloves. Anytime it's not intact skin, you should be wearing gloves. You know what it is? I mean if you're looking at your 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 child and they got a rash and and you're doing this, it's just please go wash your hands afterwards. But um, you don't know what it is, so it it you have to be very careful. And this is just the uh, saying that the potential of exposure, that you need to understand what the potential of that exposure is and protect yourself. New York State Code now places responsibility to recognize the possibility of the spread of communicable diseases and measures to stop to the licensed, uh, licensed health care worker. As I said, you are responsible to make sure that all, that all things are done to stop the spread of any communicable disease. All right, any questions on that one? <coughs> no? 
So we're okay that you understand that if you're with, that you are responsible to adhere to the infection control practices that you're going to continue to learn today and that you have been doing. What's the number one thing that would stop the spread of infection that you can do? Um, yeah. <laughs> Alright, we're going back to the chain of infection. What's interesting about the chain of infection, for the infection to occur on anybody or anything, you have to have all parts of the infection. So if you think about it, if you, um, you have to have the infectious um, agent. Let's go easy. Cold, okay? And someone sneezes, ah, chew, and if not use their elbow, use their hands. And um, go up to somebody and say, you know, help, how are you doing? And you're a susceptible host. You just finished two shifts. You got stopped over by a cop because you ran the red light because you want to go home. And then you got a flood in your house. I'm stressing you out, right? You're susceptible because your immune status just went down. So that person who coughed in their hand and they shook their hand, and then you're doing, oh my God, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you put something in your mouth just to get something in you. That's your portal of entry. Means of transport is your hands. Portal of exit and reservoir is you. It's your hands and what you've done. Yeah, and yeah, it, but it does happen. The whole idea, you need all aspects of it. I mean, if one of them breaks, then you can't get an infection. And that's why hand hygiene is very highly um, suggested and recommended. Salmonella is common food poisoning. Um, it's found in improper egg products, produce. Um, it's found, it can be found in a stool. So if someone, and they have a number of outbreaks here, um, not here, but here in the Hudson Valley. And that mostly was because first people didn't wash their hands after they were in the bathroom and they were cooks or, or food service personnel. And we've had a number of cases of that. Is it hand washing? Vectorborne is your Lyme disease, is your tick, your mm -hmm. malaria, and all those. Those are usually not considered infection control, but they ask us to review it. My favorite tuberculosis and measles are both spread by airborne mechanisms. <coughs> and in other words, they're so light that they actually can float in the air. So that's why we use air, um, negative pressure rooms or airborne activation <coughs> rooms, because they can float. So those rooms are, one, filtered six to 12 times, and then the, the air stays in the room. In any other room, the air actually flows out of the room. So, so that just to keep everything in. Uh, also noted in a couple of, um, hasn't happened recently, but there was a couple of, in doctor's offices, um, when you open up the iodine, covidine um, bottle, um, and they found that there was some pseudomonas in it and it caused a number of infections. All right, this is uh, actually Dr. Feinstein, who's the ID doctor and the chairperson for the Infection Control Committee, uh, shared some pictures with me. Um, good timing. Um, this is actually a, rich, a recent um, from Medscape, and it says uh, below the elbow and attire. What they're suggesting now, because of some studies done in England, is that anything below, that you should have nothing below the elbow. Um, that includes rings and uh, watches because that way you can actually do your hands and wash your hands quite well. And that's how you wash your hands. Plain soap. You don't need the uh, everything in the soap. Plain soap and water is fantastic. And what you're actually doing is rubbing and rubbing well. And uh, do that for 20 seconds. You can sing a song like "Row, Row, Row Your Boat." Oh, happy birthday to me! Happy birthday to me! Happy birthday, dear Marion! Happy birthday to me! Just so that you can get the the real in between the um, webs of your hands. Isolation uh, precautions are usually used in um, hospitals, and standard precautions means that everybody is treated the same. Isolation precautions actually, you can use them in doctor's offices, 
and that would be having separate rooms being available to separate out your patients. Standard, infection, uh, standard precautions include the wearing of gloves, and what's interesting in wearing of gloves is you, it, they're not, you really have to um, take them off very carefully, and if you can see it, it's from clean. You take it off the dirty hand, you just use your gloves. You take the dirty glove, you get the lip of the glove, you bring it off. You take the other glove and go inside the glove because that's the clean part. Roll it up, dump it, and then wash your hands. Always use masks, gloves, um, um, eyewear. If there's any t possibility of aerosolization, realize. And that includes if you're suctioning somebody or you're going to, um, somebody has a hematoma, but the possibility of that spurting out depends on what's the tension. So the best thing for you to do is wear gowns, gloves, and goggles so that you are eye protected. Uh, gowns, um, <coughs> in when you're taking them off, you're taking the, you, you can't touch the dirty side, which is the outside, and she'll bring them inside out, and that will do it. Like that gentleman just did from the same pro, from the same Medscape uh, program. Always, especially in hospitals, when you see contact, you should be wearing gowns and gloves upon entering the door of that particular room, and that's for you to keep from the environment of the patient. Patient care equipment um, need to clean up between patients. It's difficult, that's why we actually in the hospital we have them in the hallways and we have them in patient rooms, the bleach wipes and the uh, gray top wipes, so the equipment can be cleaned. Environment can spread disease. So when you say I'm not going I'm going into that patient room on contact, but I don't need to wear anything because I'm not touching anything. If you're touching the bed, if you touch anything, if you're shaking, you you are touching something. So if you think of a patient in the bed of a patient, that's the patient's zone, you should be wearing a gown and glove to go in there if the person's on contact. Linen is transportable uh, with infections, and um, we're always taught, at least I, mean, I know in nursing school, to keep the linen away from your body. Prevent uh, injuries with the occupational health and body Bloodborne body, bloodborne pathogens, which we talked about. Also, it's very important to prevent needle sticks. Report all, at least in the, in the hospital, to report all needle sticks to our employee health service nurse. And if you have any in the hospital, uh, in your doctor, in your offices, always have some reporting mechanism for them or a system in which they can, your employees can seek um, some aid. Never, never, never recap a needle. Never recap a needle. Test question. Never recap a needle. Um, some people say you can use the one-handed method or, or a device that's allowable depending on the situation, but um, the whole idea is trying not to get stuck. One of the other issues, especially in the OR, which they talked about, um, is actually to have a neutral zone, um, a sterile basin in which you can pass the needle or the instrument from one person to the other one because we've gotten an increased number of um, injuries from, from the, the, the surgeon is actually looking in, into what your body and, and he's trying to, ch to, to put something down and the person's trying to pick it up, it's better if they put it into a, uh, what they call a neutral zone or a basin so the other person can pick up because he cannot focus on what he's doing here because he's looking into the patient. They also are very concerned with the physicians, um, surgeons doing blind stitching, so just be careful with that because that is something that is um, dangerous. There is no, always try to use a, um, a respiratory device to do mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, and they suggest now that you actually don't do CPR with mouth-to-mouth -mouth for that one reason. Patient placements in the hospital, you can place them. Actually, in the doctor's office, you can place people, and they place them according to what the possibility of contamination is. I mean, if you have a, a, a situation in which the person is coming in either with a rash or, or coughing, 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 you can give them tissues or you can give them a mask 
well, or you can put them someplace away from the other patients. In 2007, guidelines for isolation precautions, transmissions of infectious agents in healthcare was updated, and that included respiratory hygiene cough etiquette. And that strategy is to keep patients and family members, uh, unlike those transmissible um, respiratory infections, uh, so that um, people with cough congestions, um, running noses, to in, um, and any increase in respiratory. The strategy is to go in, in with the respiratory etiquette with standard precautions. So the whole idea is just to keep the um, whatever's coming out contained. It's educating your staff, posting signs in all languages, controlling your mouth, uh, coughing in your mouth, hand hygiene after contact with respiratory section, uh, secretions, and having a spatial separation is ideal three feet, at least three feet from each other, and making sure everyone who's sneezing is actually has a tissue and covers their net mouth. Additional standard precaution methods are um, because of, oh, uh, for outbreaks that occurred in hospitals in the United States, they were very concerned with the H hepatitis B vaccine uh, um, virus and hepatitis C virus. Um, this occurred in a medical practice uh, endoscopy suite and a hematology uh, clinic, and they were what they found out that they, there was a breach of infection control standards and this happened I would say now it's about five years ago I don't know if you remember it one of them was actually in the VA hospital um, they reused they inserted a needle into a multi-dose vial they gave the patient what he had took the neural, needle, neural, needle off reuse the syringe to not realizing that was hepatitis C in the syringe, give it back into the multi-dose vice, washed it in and out, and used the syringe again and did that a couple of times. So they had a number of people that were exposed to hepatitis C. Um, they went into using single needles um, to administer uh, intravenous medications. They used a single needle to in and the syringe to do it. Um, one of the outbreaks had to do with preparation of a medication in the same work area that they used the syringe. So the person picked up the syringe um, and mixed other preparations with it. They were trying to save money, but they caused more than they needed to. <laughs> okay. In hospitals, and I'll go back to the safe nursing uh, injection thing. In hospitals, there are four types of isolation, um, actually three with two caveats. One is airborne isolation, which is for tuberculosis and measles and chicken pox, um, and disseminated zoster and smallpox, favorite topic. And that's what we were talking about, that um, they are the organisms that can float in the air, so you keep them in air um, negative pressure rooms. In doctor's offices, the best thing you can do is actually put them in a, uh, a room and just close the door, giving them the mask until you were able to transport them out. Droplet is bacterial meningitis, mumps, uh, influenza, and any um, highly resistant pneumonias. Um, those are, per se, they stay in the air, but only for like two to three, four feet maybe. So they tend to drop after that. So having someone in a single room uh, is good, um, and that we're, and that you'll see a blue sign. How many times have we seen that slide? That's the reason why we worry about sneezing and coughing is that you don't see what's coming out, but something is coming out. I think they changed it the guy that did it, because before it was an older guy. The CDC must have updated their slides a little bit. Contact has to do, the green contact sign in this hospital has to do with your enteric um, pathogens, um, like C. diff and norovirus. And the green sign is just to check, it's, it's to help us identify that we need to be seen with bleach. Um, and you cannot um, use the hand sanitizer with this particular sign, you need to use soap and water only. Um, 
the hand sanitizer doesn't work with uh, C. diff or norovirus. Um, understand too, just for your information, that there's a norovirus outbreak in Dutchess County as we speak now. Most of it is occurring in children. That's the most of the ones we have at this particular point. And there are a lot of schools here, so please, that thumbing virus could be the norovirus. Just make sure your children are hydrated very well. Um, contact, um, the other contact was a yellow sign for us. It has to do with MRSA, VRE, and Patago, scabies, and mice, and all of those. And you should be wearing contact uh, gloves and gowns upon entry, as, as in the C. diff room. And that is to protect your clothing because the environment is considered contaminated. That's the transmission base. Remember, all healthcare workers have professional responsibility to ensure clean, disinfecting, and sterilizing are affected whether or not they are directly in charge of the process. And that's what I was talking to you about before. If you are a nurse on a unit and your PCT is not cleaning when they're going in and out of each room, that's your responsibility if you're in charge of them. If you're a doctor and you're training and you have an intern or a resident with you, which we don't have here for most part, but if they're not going in the rooms and washing their hands, or hand stand, using hand sanitizer in and out of rooms, you are also responsible besides that. All right? Element three. Yes. Oh, sure. It's standards, bloodborne pathogens, and tuberculosis. Uh, high risk practices, the secretion discussed between um, equipment. In other words, cleaning your equipment between the use of patients, hepatitis B, C, and HIV are the ones that um, can be um, passed on. Precarious exposure is more likely to occur during the use of shops, especially in working and you're failing to address obvious risks, and that is the recapping of needles, manipulating of needles, removing of staple, uh, blades, um, blood suturing, using fingers, and, and in some surgeries you need to use your fingers and that's understandable. Just got just be careful with it and the suturing and you know, passing needles as we discussed already and not counting the needles or the shops that you have in surgery. Um, Health care workers have been um, injured and um, when they're passing it or blunt uh, um, suturing and it occur while other hands are in the field. Be careful what's around you. Needle sticks can be reduced um, and eliminated through uh, using engineering controls. And that may be an engineering control might be the sterile, uh, sterile um, the neutral zone, just having it there. Or there are some devices which will hold it, the tip of the, uh, the cap of the needle and that they will hold it so you're not using your hands. Such um, we have here actually at Vassar um, with drawing systems that are needleless now. So that's to um, get away from the use of needles. Also, there's always a risk of needles uh, when uh, blood fluid splashes. So that's why we look at having um, goggles for people and those occurrences. Return use of protective clothing, including gloves. Uh, gowns and uh, mandatory technicians and other ancillary staff are involved in maintaining clean work areas um, at the risk of exposure from environmental contamination. Safe injection. Hand hygiene goes along with safe injections, but you have to look at what you're doing. You staff use barriers to protect the surfaces from blood, blood, uh, blood contamination. If you're doing a clean procedure, if you have a bench and you're cleaning um, a piece of equipment here, you cannot be mixing medication in the same spot. Basically, that's what it is. Because the possibility, even though you're cleaning it off, the possibility of contamination is still there. Um, staff uses a septic technique to avoid contamination, uh, uh, contamination of sterile injection equipment and medication. Cleansing the diaphragm um, or the neck of the glass apule with 70% alcohol before use because anytime 
If that's been out in the air, any that could be uh, contaminated very easily. Staff will not use bags or bottles of uh, IV solution as a common source of supply for multiple patients. So, as sometimes in the good old days, um, we used to put a 500 liter bag of um, um, saline to, to flush. Now we have individual ones for that one reason because you couldn't have, because somebody could have contaminated that bag and you wouldn't know it. <clears throat> multiple dose vials are used, restricted use to centralized medication area, discard multiple vials. It's, uh, <clears throat> if sterility is compromised. That's one reason we don't use multiple vials. We, single dose vials is what we're looking at and hopefully using. All right. If you're using a multiple vial for one patient, then you should not be sharing that when that person goes home or whatever. You should not be using the same multiple vial on somebody else. You know about the pre-filled uh, syringes, ampules, and the use of sterile single-use disposable needles. Do not recap and do not reuse. There are infection control practice for lumbar puncture procedures involving uh, any um, spinal catheter or injection of materials in the spinal catheter. It is suggested that you wear a mask, gown, and gloves when you do it because Five years ago, um, there were some infections that were actually noted because um, they found the, the causative agent on the physician that was doing the spinal taps, and it was actually the same. So that's why this suggestion came up that you wear masks and gloves and gowns when you're going to do that. And I say goggles just in case you get eye splashes. Never, never reuse a needle or syringe that's been used on the patient. Multi-drug, oh, we actually went through this already, so I'll leave that. Um, MedWatch um, is an FDA safety, um, and is informed of, has informed healthcare workers. There have been a number of clusters of patients, um, and they found that the multivial in several lots of propofol was used on patients who experienced only fever, body aches, and that was it. They didn't grow anything but they thought that the um, propofol vial was contaminated with an endotoxin, and that's why they couldn't grow anything. So you can actually not have a bug in there, but if you, if you transport an endotoxin in there, you can actually get a reaction, um, either fever, um, body aches, and chills. So that's why they um, suggest not to refill um, syringes. And to evaluate anybody for bacterial sepsis if that person develops uh, fevers, chills, or body aches. The healthcare professionals who administer the propofol for sedation in general should be careful to follow recommendations of handling the use of products, full prescribed information. Um, this is the occurrence that I was talking about before from the VA, and you can see what they did. I mean, they did a, a great write up on this particular case as a learning for everybody else, but as you can see, they had a clean needle and um, a vial, um, a known um, H, uh, hepatitis C patient, they redo the needle out, reused it, and they used the bottle and hepatitis C went into the multi-use vial, and then they started giving it to everybody else that they treated. It was... I want to say about 800 people that were called on this one, but um, it was a lot. Um, pick up um, skills promptly. Um, have a, a system on how to pick them up and what's easier to do. Oh, one of my bugs. Um, MRSA um, is in the community. There is actually two or three different types of community MRSA. So MRSA is not necessary anything to do. It used to be years ago, um, MRSA was nothing but a hospital bug. Now we have found um, there's two or three strains of the MRSA that are actually purely community-based um, that actually can be tested, but it's interesting. Um, there's been a lot of outbreaks in the community with it, in gyms, 
um, because people are not cleaning off the uh, stop making faces. <laughs> Um, when you go into the gym, suggest that you do use the wipes and wipe off the chairs and your handlebars so that um, we don't we, we love each other but don't really want to spit, share the uh, bacteria. Um, there is requirements on red bag waste. Um, dressings do not have to go in red bag waste unless you can actually squeeze out the blood. I actually can go in regular waste. All shops go into special containers. Uh, blood vials um, that have been used for blood, even if there's only a trace of blood, has to go in red bag waste. Um, use and unused needles. Remember, even if the needle's unused and you're ditching it, you still have to put it in a container. The reason for that is that if they find that one needle that's clean, and they find it's from your office or your hospital, the Department of Sanitation doesn't care that it was not used they will cite you. Live through it. They will cite you. So um, always put them all together. Um, anything that is sharp, um, pass you up by a pet. I don't even know where you're still using those. Um, any blades, like in a laboratory, if you're looking at flies and anything, make sure it goes into a sharp bottle. Um, that would be your best bet because it, you really don't want the sanitation department being upset. Um, if you have infectious waste, um, if you're doing cultures or stock agents of human products, that all goes into um, medical waste. Um, and so there's um, human pathogen waste if you're doing any procedures in your um, hospital, in your work area. Okay. Application for the high accuracy concept of airborne pathogens, which we actually did talk some about. Um, just recognize that those people that need to go into airborne isolation, it's better to go overboard than to go underboard. Because if you go overboard, you <coughs> protect everybody. If you go underboard, you might be exposing you and your colleagues to uh, something that doesn't need to happen. And the easiest way to do it in a clinic setting or in an office is actually just put them in a separate room um, that's not being used. Personal protective equipment, which we will go through again. What can I do to improve infections? You don't have this one. This is one of the new ones I got from Medscape. Um, what you, what you, what I found very interesting about this particular slide is that it's biofilm, and um, those, um, my microbiology is coming out. Sorry, these are bacteria, right? Those are gram negatives. What I find interesting about the gram negatives, after a little while, they're little suckers. Um, I always think of them as being in a different world. Um, men of black, no men, men in black. I'm from that school age. Um, and what these little bacteria do, they're little smart little suckers. <coughs> they will develop a goo. I call it a goo. Um, but they will develop something to protect them. And especially with catheters, either central line catheters or Foley catheters, they will develop a film. So it's very hard to get any antibiotics in there to kill them because they've already protected them with this coating. So they're not they're pretty good. And they do react with the, the whatever type of uh, catheter solution, but they will develop this film, which is one of the reasons. And that's how it ended up. And there's a lot of bacteria in there, but there's also the biofilm that's with them. And that's one reason you should always scrub the hub. And any, any entry into any IV or anything like that, please scrub the hub. Um, another um, new one is um, all our toys. I don't know what else to call them but toys at this particular point. Uh, and, and we are hip. We are, it, it, they're to the hip. Mine is right over there. It's not on my hip yet, but it's over there. Um, and what you have to be careful with is, especially if you're seeing a patient, if you're taking your, your phone out or your iPad or what, make sure you disinfect it. Um, most of the time I would suggest be careful with your screen. There are covers for the screen. Um, the other thing is I will tell you, you can wipe it down with alcohol, but not soaking. It's really just to wipe it down. And, and like I said, watch out with your screens. And always wash your hands. <coughs> Salud.
and my favorite, the stethoscope. Clean off your stethoscope between patients for your safety and theirs. There is a um, organization that uh, can can washing for life that has a video that I actually like very much. Um, and what they did is they saw they had, the person had blue hands, which meant they had an MRSA on their hands. And um, the doctor came, and the person had a, a wound, a chest wound, went and used his stethoscope on the chest wound. And then he went and was talking to the nurse and had his hand on the bell. And then he went to his next patient, so he, it was on this hand now. And then the next person who had a fresh op, it went there. And then he held the patient's bed, and so it was on the bed. And then it went to the curtain, and, it, and you can see where the track is. So it's very interesting to look at it. So we must, you know, we have our tools, and we need to have, make sure they're clean. Only reason I picked it is sandals. Gentlemen, you're, you're okay with you got you don't wear sandals at least in the hospital during the uh, summer. Us ladies, we need to have our toes covered, and that's protection. That's actually an OSHA requirement. If OSHA came in here and looked at, even if you're from the OR, you know those cloths with the holes in them. Think about it. What happens if you drop a blood or patient blood bleeds out? How's your feet protected? If you have the ones with holes in them, they're not. So that's what you need to look at, and, and that's the only reason I kept this one here. Um, there are PPEs. We went over it. You gotta be careful, especially with your staff members. If there's somebody like in central sterile processing or someone who's doing your decontamination of your equipment, make sure they have the thick utility rooms or what I used to call Playtex gloves, and not the uh, what I call the exam gloves, which are much thinner. Um, and also understand that those exam gloves can have, it's okay for them to have holes. So the exam gloves, yeah, the FDA, okay. They're not supposed to have so many, but there's, there's a certain number they're supposed to have. Um, non sterile gloves or exam gloves, they've been trying to keep away from latex. Um, but you have to be careful also with anything that's latex if you have a patient who's actually allergic to latex. Procedure points to remember when one uses gloves. When one uses gloves, what you have to do? When you use gloves, what do you have to do? Before and after. Wash your hands. Gowns and gloves, same thing. Once you finish the whole taking off and everything, you should be washing your hands. And also, anytime the possibility of a aerosolization. Um, <coughs> anything with your eyes, please make sure you're wearing your, your glasses are not sufficient. The only reason your glasses are not sufficient, there are goggles that we do have, is that they actually can come behind the glasses. So if something spreads, you know, if, if someone has a, a shooter and it spreads and it goes down here, your glasses isn't doing you any good because you're at, the blood is actually going into your eyes. So um, just make sure you wear protective goggles and your mask or respiratory or N95, depending on what it causes. And someone's coming in and they're coughing and you don't know what it is and they don't have night sweats, you might want to consider using a mask. So at least you have some type of protection. I always think this is common sense, but guidance on proper precautions is if you think about it. If someone is bleeding, then wear your gloves and gowns and, and masks and, and um, goggles to protect you. If someone is, in, you have to look at what's happening. If you're going in to give them a bath, you should be wearing a gown and glove because you'll be touching and, and maneuvering them and definitely working into their areas. And if you're going in to change your dressing, you should be wearing gown and gloves. What you do, what your actions are, is what's going to tell you what type of per, uh, personal protective equipment to have. If you're going to be a dentist and you're going to be drilling, you should be wearing goggles and gowns and gloves because that's going all over the place. 
except for me because I don't have cavities. And we already actually went through this, the downing, uh, donning of gloves. Gowns goes on first, then the mask, the goggles, and then the gloves of all ass. Um, make sure the goggles are comfortable and that you do wear them appropriately. Position, depending on the type of eyewear you have, this one is a shield over the face, so have your, your uh, mask on first and make sure you're comfortable and you're able to see. Because if you're wearing a eye protection that you can't see, you're not going to use it. Right? You're not going to use it. So please, you know, make sure they're comfortable and you use it. You down your gloves on last um, and making sure that they're covered so there's no seepage. Keep your gloves, hands off of your face. You can do this, but don't do this. I had a discussion with one nurse I was sitting in in um, one of the ICUs, not here, someplace else. And um, and she kept touching my face with the gloves on, and I'm looking at her, and, and she's, you know, and I'm looking at her, and I stop, and I says, you know, do me the favor, you know, I'm just gonna, you know, tell you, you you're harming yourself because you, oh, these, I didn't touch anything, I didn't touch my face, and her colleague looked at me and says, oh yes, you did, <laughs> because she kept arguing with me. I says, we don't realize we have that habit. I mean, I have a habit of doing this, and I just realized that I'm saying, I need to stop doing that because, you know, why am I doing it? You know? <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong. With my, but I keep touching my nose, but it, it's something that we have to, you know, just realize what we're doing, uh, especially when we're taking care of our, uh, our patients. Removal, we talked about the contaminated, contaminated part of the gown or glove is on the outside or the front. So always remove it, making this inside of it and bringing the inside the inside of it out when you're discarding it. Um, that's to keep you um, safe. Uh, sequence is gloves first, then goggles, uh, gowns, and then the respirator last. Always leave it by the door, uh, doorway. You should have a receptacle at the doorway. Um, ensure that the Hand washing is available, um, either the alcohol base, as depending on it, or the uh, soap and water. Um, glass, um, we did talk about this, and peel away the hand and then use the upper side using the dirty end of it to uh, remove the uh, gloves. And our face shield, respiratory, unfasten, discard, roll up. Untie from the back and discard, don't touch the front of the mask. Our N95s, you lift up and discard. Hand hygiene. Please, again, hand hygiene is very important, and it's, it is a visual, it's a way of get, containing um, our um, infections. Anybody needs a break because we're at five. We all okay? Okay. Anybody wants to pick up a coffee or anything? Right there? Go for it. Creating and maintaining the safe environment for patient care facility uh, in all patient care settings um, and the application of infection control principles and practices for cleaning and disinfecting. And sterilization. Instruments must be cleaned by industry guidelines. Always look at any piece of equipment that you have. Always look at what the manufacturer's guidelines are. That will make that will save you if there is a lawsuit. Believe me, they are lawsuits. I was an uh, uh, expert work, witness on um, one lawsuit, which I thought was very interesting because they were they it was an orthopedic surgeon, and he had a number of infections, but each infection was actually related. Were not related. They were not the same organism. They were. I mean, there was no, they were months apart. He just had a past proof. And um, actually, um, we looked at his process. His process was fine. And um, probably eventually um, they dropped the, the lawsuit. Um, but um, anybody can do that. So always make sure that your process of cleaning your equipment is, is um, tied up and done well. And if you you do abide by the industry standard or the actually the manufacturer's written guidelines, 
always have a copy of that in your book for those people who are you who are, you answer who are under you who are cleaning your equipment so that um, they have the guidelines and make sure that they're following the guidelines and there's no shortcut. Some shortcuts could be um, they sterilize something on a um, desktop autoclave and it comes out wet. That that instrument has to be redone because it can't come out wet. It has to be tried. So I mean, it's stuff like that. Or oh, I think I can put these two steps together. There's a reason why the steps are separate. Also, in an endoscopy, you got to make sure that that soap is dry inside because if that soap is not dry, it can cause bacteria to grow, and the next person you use the soap in can actually. Um, can cause them harm. So it's really looking at the manufacturer's guidelines and following them. Potential contamination is dependent on the type of instrument, the medical device or equipment or the environment. So the environment is also important because if you're using a dirty room, but the dirty room is also the clean room, you got a problem because the cross contamination is very possible. So if you're spatially limited, you need somebody to look at to see what the process is to use the room. I mean, you, there are ways you can work with it, but you have to make sure that your staff are trained and they follow what the protocol is. <coughs> Potential contamination from blood stem in the environment sources of organisms and levels of contamination. Every reprocessing requires pre-cleaning, cleaning, disinfecting, and sterilization. Pre-cleaning. Pre-cleaning is a process in which you're taking the, that uh, instrument or equipment that you can visually see the blood on it and actually wiping that off. Then you can then send it for cleaning, but it must be wiped off first before. And that's what one of the in the OR they require that people that the, the, the instruments are actually wiped off once the procedure is finished. Uh, cleaning is actually doing <coughs> physical cleaning with a, uh, usually a brush. Disinfecting is the other um, disinfecting is depending on the the instrument, you might not need to be sterile it might not be sterilized. Like endoscopy uh, soaps do not need to be sterilized, but they definitely need to be cleaned. So it depends on the type of equipment. <coughs> the level of reprocessing is really depending on what the equipment is, and uh, the, the easiest way to address that is actually manufacturer's guidelines. If you follow the manufacturer's guidelines, you got it. Make sure that your disinfecting is appropriate for that piece of equipment. Surface cleaning between uh, is required between procedures. If you're going from procedure to procedure endoscopy, that room needs to be cleaned before the next person comes in. If you're going to a dental office, the room needs to be cleaned before the next person comes in and to be set up. The, the reason why you need to clean each room is the possibility of cross-contamination from the next from the previous person. And we talked about the reuse of single-use items. That is not allowed. If it's a re if it's a single use item, you cannot reuse it because if you, you reuse it, guess who's going to come down to you? The FDA, because then you consider yourself a manufacturer and you're reusing the item. And you really don't want the FDA in your office or in the hospital. You don't want them. Believe me. There have been cases of failure to reprocess it. The VA is one of them, and that was an endoscopy. Um, they missed a step or didn't, um, I, I believe the machine um, wasn't functioning correctly and they contaminated a lot of people and that had to do with inadequate, they weren't following the steps that required, uh, especially on scopes. If you're packaging the piece of equipment once it's clean, make sure it's properly, when you store it, you store it properly, you got to be careful of the humidity and the temperature of the room that you're storing the equipment in. And you have to keep records. You have to keep records that this piece of equipment was done by Mary Ann and was done on this date, was used on this patient and redone by Sue, Sue on this date. 
and we use this process. Because once if there's a recall and two if there's a lawsuit, you have the proof that that piece of equipment was clean. And that in you, you, it was sterilized at this time and on this and you keep those strips just in case. Verify those responsible for reprocessing are taking the necessary steps. Have who, if you're in a private office, have the person who's responsible for your equipment and walk through them every once a year to make sure that they're actually doing what's required of them. Because they think that they're, they're doing a, um, the, the shortcut may be your license on, the, on board. So that's what you're doing, protected. Always understand the percent, uh, concept of standard precautions. Everybody's, everybody's the same. Um, you're treating everybody the same. You're treating, if it was a young child um, or if it's an old lady, you're treating them everybody the same. If you see, if it's not for anything, drop it or anything like that. Very far, did I get that one? I think I, did I go back? Always monitor, as I said. Manufacturer's guidelines protect the equipment from contamination whenever possible. If you're using a piece of equipment that you don't use every day or it's on the weekend, make sure it's bag, as we call bag and tag. Put a bag over it saying that it's clean and um, then store it. Avoid hazards. Um, review the following points. Review the manufacturer's cleaning guidelines. Protect the equipment from contamination. If there's a Potential that you think that the equipment is um, unsterile, then you need to make sure that it is, and I'll send it back to manufacturers and disinfect it actually before you send it in. That's what I did. If equipment is contaminated, blood or pad, make sure it's cleaned off. Healthcare workers. Employee health service must do certain things for someone who's retired. Um, retired. I'm, I'm jumping my gun. Um, Pre-placement uh, immunization that's required by the state is needle a month. Varicella uh, varicella is no longer needed. Happy and annual flu shots. Um, tuberculosis screening and screening of any communicable disease. And that's usually done by a questionnaire. Anybody who has symptoms of fever, cough, rash, or vascular or draining wound or vomiting should not be working or diarrhea. They should not come into work. The risk for employees um, are definitely um, hepatitis B, C, and HIV. We do over here the hepatitis B vaccine. We do emphasize hand washing. We use um, we have barrier proportions on each unit. Um, safe. Um, boxes uh, for um, shop boxes and we do follow standard precautions. We talked about the blood one pathogens and the requirements of having uh, certain standards available or um, policies available for reading um, and you can actually be, the hospital can be cited if we don't follow what we wrote and that's on our uh, policy book. Uh, airborne and drop it Pathogens are uh, of a concern in making sure that our, our employees are uh, protected and making sure that we have the airborne negative, uh, negative pressure rooms and that we have um, droplet precautions and the signs up for them and to assure that there's no one filling this room without proper PPE. <coughs> Uh, Department of Health does have a policy on HIA testing of healthcare workers in the event of an exposure. Um, actually, that law has changed a year and a half ago, two years ago. We can actually now, if there's uh, a related exposure, we don't need consent from the um, patient. Um, we can blind test the patient. Um, we would, would, what the New York State Department of Health has given us permission to do if that patient has blood in the laboratory, we can test it, but we cannot um, identify the patient or that record cannot go on that patient's chart. The knowledge of that patient's status is for only the exposure so that the um, healthcare worker can know and have the knowledge if the person was either HIV, hepatitis C, or um, 
be positive. That's all done through a blind testing with employee health service, at least here. Um, a code is given to the person. The code is actually reported to the Department of Health, but only the code, not the person's name, the patient's name that refused to or could not give the permission to. So it's just so that they have records of it. Um, so um, we've done. What's happening when it's positive? We do not, we are not allowed to tell the patient. We did that for you one for a while and we remarked that there's a policy. When you did positive, we have. But for an employee exposure? I'm talking about the patient, not the employee. Well, you will know. But for but an employee exposure, it cannot tell the patient. You cannot tell them they are positive. If it's a blind test. Yes. So and that their workers are exposed and they're and they're tested and they're found to be positive, they can't go back to the person they were exposed from and tell them that they're positive. No, but we'll tell the healthcare worker that they need, they were exposed. No, no, we're the healthcare worker, they have to have us, but what about the patient who's now We're not allowed. Yeah. We're not allowed. And that's in the re most recent HIV testing um, law. We start doing that on new board, and we discover some, and no injury, and the state has to reverse that. Now we tell them. They haven't reversed the, the adult part of it. That I can tell you. So, if the patient doesn't know they have HIV, we can't tell them either. Right. But isn't that injustice to the public if this person is spreading it around? Because, I mean, where's our liability in this? Responsibility to protect the public. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but the law says. And we, I must tell you, I, we do re report the positive to the state, but we cannot report the name of the patient. So we will report um, 1, 2, 3, March 2nd, which we always put the date on it for us, and, and that's the positive. We cannot give it to the patient. So then, who contacts the patient? The state is that the way it goes? I don't. No, they no, don't. They don't get contacted. No name. That's the name. That's the name. I'm just saying the patient didn't I'm, get I'm, get I'm sorry that I tell them to do that. Want to replay that again? <laughs> All right. In the most recent HIV testing law required. Remember, it's about a year and a half, two years ago. They required us to offer the HIV test to anybody who wants it. Right. From the age of 13 to 64, why they stopped at 64, I still haven't figured out yet. But anyway, um, so say they come in and, and test, okay? That's fine. In that law, it also states that if there's an exposure to an employee, healthcare employee, and either the patient cannot be a consent, there's no one to consent, there's no ability to do an administrative consent or any of those other factors. The, the blood of that person can be tested if the specimens in the laboratory for the healthcare worker to have the knowledge if the patient is positive or not positive. But you cannot. But we cannot. Specifically no. For the patient. We would have to go to the so laboratory you have to, to see. Have actually specimen in the lab that you know of. If you don't, then you have to speak to the patient. There no, has to be. What if the patient is 70 years old and the patient has AIDS and the patient has a new body? Is that just for HIV or HIV? HIV. You tell them this? HIV. Does the woman that you or do you speak to them? The law protection. Protect us. Yes, ma'am. Sure, the employee will know that they're exposed, but the patient knows nothing. Correct. Right. Right. And the only way oh, they'll know is if they consent to the actual HIV. What has happened most recently is that the physician um, was it was suggested for the patient to take the test. Who was suggested? Right, that's the person who's going to ask the patient. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah. You ask the patient. Is, but if the patient you're saying is uncommunicative or whatever, then. 
that person cannot win. So you're going to be drawing the blood in that individual for that particular test to be given, right? Or you can ask the um, healthcare proxy. <coughs> you can ask the healthcare proxy for permission to consent. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Don't forget the world is in your hand, and so is hand washing. <laughs> And then that note, I love it. Uh, the text is in the back. I'll correct it. 80% or better, 16 out of 20. It's yours. Okay. 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 Oh. I have a question about those uh, the cells that you have here in the hospital that care of the divine and those in the hospital. We are presently yes, tested throughout. We're in the present moment testing another one that's not an alcohol based but a benzoyl chloride based. And once that pilot should end by Monday. And then the corporation the system will decide on a uh, product which will probably be. It's not the FDA required not all the companies to send you to the microbial soap, whether they're going to work or not. Are they asking the workers? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. Yes. The test is on South Park 7 again. <laughs> and I, I'm actually, the Pharrell part of it, I'm calculating. 